Number 1. Andrew was last seen in Jefferson, Massachusetts on September 30, 1978. He resided in a mobile home on Richards Avenue at the time, and on the morning of his disappearance, he was playing in the woods behind the nearby Ash Avenue with his seven-year-old sister and six-year-old cousin. Andrew and his cousin went deeper into the woods without his sister. At some point, Andrew tripped and fell. He injured himself and lost his favorite toy, a weeble. He started crying and running in circles and stated he would not leave until he found his toy. His cousin told him to stay in that spot while he went to get help at 10.30 a.m. By the time they returned to the woods, Andrew had vanished. He was never seen again. An extensive 10-day search uncovered no trace of Andrew or his whereabouts. He and his cousins had been told not to go in those woods, but they disobeyed and went anyways. Authorities believe it's possible that Andrew was abducted by a passing motorist. He disappeared about 50 yards away from Route 52 which is now known as Interstate 395. This is now discredited since police dogs could only lead them to the spot he tripped in. This likely means someone took Andrew 8 where he was left. Eight days after his disappearance, a Mickey Mouse shirt was found stained and wrapped in a paper bag in Woburn, Massachusetts. Two suspects have been named in his disappearance. One of those suspects is Nathaniel Barr Jonah. He is believed to have raped and murdered multiple children throughout his life. He is also considered a possible suspect in the 1973 Connecticut disappearance of Janice Pocket, the 1996 Montana abduction of Zachary Ramsey, and the 1997 Wyoming disappearance of Amanda Galleon. In 2000, investigators found the bone fragments of a child buried six feet underneath his dirt, floor garage in Montana. The bone fragments were not those of Zachary Ramsey. Janice and Amanda's families sent their DNA for comparison to the remains, but they also did not match. Andrew's DNA was never compared with the bones. Investigators also believe Bar Jonah was involved in cannibalism. Human hair was found in a meat grinder at his home. It did not belong to any of his possible missing victims. The reason why investigators have questioned his possible involvement in Andrew's disappearance was since he grew up in Webster, Massachusetts at the time. Dudley is only 33 minutes away from Jefferson. In December of 2001, a handwritten list by Bar Jonah surfaced. It was titled Lake Webster, and it included the names of multiple alleged victims of Bar Jonah. Some news reports have falsely claimed that Andrew was among the children on the list, but he wasn't, and there's no evidence suggesting he was involved in the case. Bar Jonah's given name was David P. Brown in up until 1991. Bar Jonah died of a blood clot in Montana prison in 2008. He was 51 years old when he died. He was never charged with any wrongdoing in Andrew's case, and there's no evidence suggesting his involvement in the case. In June of 1998, investigators excavated a wooded area off of Minebrook Road. They learned that possible evidence related to the case was possibly buried in the area. The area was approximately five miles away from the area of his disappearance. Nothing was discovered as a result of the search. In November of 2003, investigators learned that a Rhode Island man confessed to abducting and murdering Andrew in 1999. He allegedly confessed on his deathbed to his mother and a sibling. He had passed away from long cancer, and after four years, his family decided to divulge the information to authorities. Apparently, this man was a Rhode Island laborer and was 53 years old at the time of Andrew's apparent abduction. He came to authorities' attention after saying he heard of the well-publicized man hung over his radio. He was the one who would find Andrew's missing weeble under a pile of leaves. This area had already been searched before, and the toy was not there. Investigators have declined to reveal the suspect's name or any other information, but call his confession credible. A rural area in Burialville, Rhode Island, 
was excavated and searched. This was the area the suspects said he buried the child, but no remains or evidence was found. At the time of his disappearance, Andrew was described as a very friendly and kind boy. The local people who knew him called him the Goodwill Ambassador. Andrew remains missing and foul play is suspected. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Webster Police Department 617-943-1212. Number 2. Throughout history there have been those who have just seemed to have stepped off the face of the earth to never be heard from again. These people just seem to drop out of existence, sometimes leaving bizarre clues, but just as often leaving no trace behind at all. On occasion there are those cases that go into dark territory, hinting at nefarious dealings and grim outcomes, but never letting these things come up into the light from the gloom within which they dwell. One such case concerns a teenage girl, who went out in broad daylight only to evaporate from existence, sending authorities and her mother on a chase through dark waters and a criminal underworld in a futile search for answers. Amy Billig was a 17-year-old high school student who lived in Coconut Grove, Florida with her parents, Ned and Susan, and younger brother, Josh. She seemed to have her whole future ahead of her, considered by her teachers and peers to be smart and a talented poet and flute and guitar player. On March 5, 1974, Amy came home from school at around noon to have lunch, after which she called her father at the art gallery he owned asking if she could borrow some money to go out with some friends later. He said for her to come on over and she headed along Main Highway in Coconut Grove, hitchhiking for a ride. It might seem pretty shocking and reckless in this day and age that she would be hitchhiking, but at the time it was fairly normal and a popular way for young people to get around. Indeed, Amy was known to frequently hitchhike to around town and had never had any incidents before. It would not have seemed particularly strange at the time to see this young woman hitchhiking in broad daylight, and there would have been no reason for alarm at this point. However, Amy would never reach the art gallery, and indeed she would never be heard from again. When Amy failed to show up at her father's place of work and still not had come home by evening, police were notified, and they began interviewing everyone who had known her or seen her that day looking for leads but they came up with little to go on, except the discovery of Amy's camera, which had been found at the Wildwood exit on the Florida Turnpike, but the overexposed photos within offered no clues. Her hairbrush was then found at a convenience store in Kissimmee, but this too offered no real leads. As this was going on there were some interesting developments. A few days after she had gone missing, Amy's mother, Susan Billig, would be contacted by two 16-year-old twins named Charles and Larry Glasser, who claimed to have kidnapped her and demanded a $30,000 ransom, but this was soon uncovered by police as a scam and extortion attempt, with the two teens never having even met Amy. In the meantime, Amy's picture was being heavily circulated in the region, which began to bring in some ominous new leads. There began to come in numerous witnesses who claimed that Amy had gotten caught up with a notorious biker gang called the Pagans, who had been in the area at the time of her disappearance. The reports of just what had happened to her varied, with some witnesses saying she had been kidnapped and sold into slavery, while others said she had been murdered. One anonymous caller claimed that Amy had been picked up while hitchhiking, and was being held against her will with another woman. Susan was even able to arrange a meeting with some bikers from the gang, but they were unable to provide any solid leads, merely admitting that some of the gang members would kidnap young women from time to time to be sold. Susan then went about traveling around looking for answers, finding yet more witnesses, including a convenience store manager, who said he had seen Amy with some bikers shortly after her vanishing. Yet none of this brought her any closer to finding her missing daughter. Over the years there would be numerous sightings of Amy all over the place, usually describing her as being with bikers and obviously their property. In 1975, one of these people reached out to her directly, 
when a pagan member and enforcer named Paul Branch contacted Susan, after seeing her picture in the missing person flyers and the papers, he told her that Amy had been a girl he had been given by another biker named Brackett, making her his property. He claimed that he had then been arrested and put in jail, and that by the time he had gotten out Amy had been passed along to someone else. He told Susan that he would try to track down the guy who took her, finding out that she was in Tulsa. After this, Branch actually met with Susan in Tulsa to help her look for her daughter, scouring the seedy biker underworld of strip club joints, tattoo parlors, and biker bars and hangouts, all of this alien to the mother, but things would go south, when Branch was involved in a fight Susan escaped. He would later contact her with a tip, that Amy was now in Seattle, and that was the last she would hear from him. The ever-brave Susan made her way to Seattle with a friend, and continued her search, finding a potential lead with a stripper called Willow, who was claimed to be Amy. However, when Susan actually met Willow she found that it was a woman who merely resembled her, another dead end. Although she gathered many sightings of Amy in Seattle, her daughter remained elusive. The trail would go cold until 1979, when a new lead came in. On this occasion, an anonymous caller contacted Susan to tell her he had found Amy at a truck stop in Reno, Nevada, and that she should come quickly, but by the time she arrived on the scene with police there was no one there, and the caller was never identified. One very promising lead came in 1992, when a British investigator contacted Susan with a tip that an American biker in Falmouth, England, had been trying to sell a girl who fit Amy's description. Susan would then travel all the way to England and become convinced that the woman had indeed been Amy, but they were never able to track down the mysterious biker or the missing woman, so we will never know. One of the oddest aspects of the case is that through all of this, starting from just five months after Amy had gone missing, Susan was constantly plagued by anonymous phone calls from a man who told her that Amy was part of a sex ring, later claiming that in fact he had her. These calls would continue for years, with authorities never able to catch him, because he used a payphone. It would not be until 1995 that the FBI would track him down after he used a cell phone, only to find that he was actually a man named Henry Johnson Blair, who bizarrely happened to be employed with the U.S. Customs Department. When asked why he had spent over two decades relentlessly taunting and harassing Susan Billig, he claimed that it was due to his alcoholism and obsessive-compulsive disorder, and that he in fact had never known or met Amy. Police would doubt this when they found journal entries Amy had written talking about fantasizing about running off to South America with a man called Hank which just happened to be Blair's nickname, and it also just so happened that his work often brought him to South America. He would end up serving a two-year prison sentence for harassment, but was never charged in relation to Amy's disappearance. The whole case would get even stranger in 1997, when Branch's wife stepped forward to tell the BBC that he had changed his whole story on his deathbed. According to her, he had told her that he hadn't been truthful with Susan, and that Amy had actually been drugged, raped, and killed at a party shortly after her disappearance, after which her body had been chopped up and thrown into a swamp in the Florida Everglades. At first, authorities and Amy's family believed this confession to be true, but it was called into question when it turned out that the woman had been well compensated for her breaking story. Because of this and the fact that no remains were ever found, it is now thought that the confession was fabricated in order to cash in on the notoriety of the case. Susan Billig would spend the rest of her life searching for her daughter, doggedly tracking down every clue or scrap of information she could, also writing a book on it all in 2001 called Without a Trace, A Mother's Search for Justice, but would ultimately never meet her again dying in 2005 with no closure or answers. It is a very mysterious and tragic tale that has been featured on such hit shows Unsolved Mysteries and America's Most Wanted.
To this day Amy Billig has never been found, her fate unknown. What happened to her? Did she end up kidnapped and murdered by bikers, or did she simply run away? What part do all of the various players have in this, if any? How could such an extensive search turn up nothing at all? No one knows, and Amy Billig has never been seen again. Number 3. Cynthia was last seen in Russellville, Arkansas on December 2, 1976. She was last seen at a residence in the Fairview Estates neighborhood at approximately 5.30 p.m. She was never seen or heard from again after her disappearance. Cynthia wasn't the only girl to disappear that day. Two other girls, 13-year-old Teresa Williams and 14-year-old Crystal Danita Parton, were both reported missing from their residences which were in the same neighborhood as Cynthia. None of the three girls were ever seen again. Investigators initially considered them as runaways, but later revised their theory on the cases. On Thanksgiving Day of 1986, a couple who were deer hunting found what appeared to be human bones in a remote area located near the Pope Newton County line. On December 2, 1986, investigators located three leg bones and an arm bone while searching the area. Two days later, investigators found a matted mass which had bones, clothing, and roots in it. They eventually found a near-complete human skeleton which was wearing a decomposing coat and underwear. The bones were scattered over a 200 to 300 foot area. It was speculated that the bodies were originally buried in a shallow grave and were scattered as the result of a flood in 1982 or due to animal activity. Investigators also found an old number 10 shotgun shell casing with nine buckshot near the bodies. There was no evidence it was involved in the crimes. Investigators felt that the remains belonged to the three girls who were missing for 10 years by then. A state medical examiner initially concluded the remains belonged to three females in between the ages of 12 and 14. This was later disproven as there were only two bodies in the area. Dental records confirmed that the two sets of remains belonged to Teresa Williams and Crystal Parton. Both girls had been fatally stabbed in the necks. Investigators didn't find Cynthia's remains and the cases remained unsolved for 12 years after that. In October of 1998, investigators stated they knew who killed the three Russellville girls. A woodcutter named James B. Grinder was named as their probable killer. At the time, he was already in prison serving a sentence for burglary in Missouri. Earlier that year, he was charged with the murder of Julie Helton who was 25, when she was slain in 1984. James admitted he knew Cynthia, Teresa, and Crystal in 1976. He initially told police he gave them a ride from Russellville to Pottsville, Arkansas on the day they went missing. He claimed that he gave them $20 and left them on an interstate. He later confessed to killing the three girls. James stated he picked the three girls up on the outskirts of Russellville, and drove them to Moralton, Arkansas. He purchased alcohol for them, and then brought them to the Brock Cemetery. He raped Crystal and Teresa, before stabbing them to death. He covered their bodies up with brush. He claimed that he drove Cynthia to a location in the Ozark National Forest. He said he raped Cynthia, and beat her to death using a tire iron. He said he left her body there without attempting to conceal it. Grinder was charged with capital murder in the murders. He was only charged with one count since the crime was said to be a premeditated homicide of two or more people. James plead guilty to the crimes and was sentenced to life in prison. He later requested that his sentence be reduced and claimed he was forced by police to confess to the murders. He claimed that others were involved in killing the three girls, but he is believed to be lying and his request was denied. He died in prison from natural causes. Cynthia's body was never found. Her mother, Clara, passed away in 2014 and she enlisted Cynthia's pre-deceasing her. Foul play is suspected in her case. If you have any information concerning this case, 
please contact Russellville Police Department 479-968-3232. Number 4. Bobby was last seen in Colville, Washington on August 3, 1963. He was camping with his family at the Deep Lake Resort, now defunct, in Norther Stevens County. He was with his father and mother, Howard and Edna Panknan. His three older brothers, Bill Jim, and Ted Panknan. Bobby was hiking with Edna, Jim, and Bill at the time of his disappearance. They were hiking on a logging road near the campsite. No one else was on the road at the time they were on it. Bill left the road to go and see a small creek that he thought sounded like the Laughing Brook in the Thornton Burgess children's stories that the family enjoyed reading in 1963. Edna followed Bill towards the creek and instructed Jim to stay on the road with Bobby. Jim, however, decided to follow his mother and brother, leaving Bobby alone on the road. Bill quickly found that the creek wasn't what he was expecting, and they all returned to where Bobby was last standing. They were gone for a matter of minutes, likely five and were only a hundred feet away. By the time they came back, Bobby was gone. He was never seen or heard from again afterwards. Ted and Howard were fishing when Bobby disappeared, and soon found out what had happened. Ted searched the road that Bobby had gone missing from, but didn't find any evidence of his whereabouts. Ted said he wished he had walked further down than he had, because maybe Bobby was nearby. Police were called, and they began to organize an extensive search for the boy. The search for Bobby was likely the largest in Stevens County history, but no one ever found Bobby. Investigators utilized a bloodhound search dog, and it sniffed Bobby's shoe to detect his scent. The dog ran for about two miles, while chasing Bobby's scent, and then stopped dead in its tracks at a fork in the road. He never went back on the trail. Over 500 people were involved in the search for little Bobby. These searches were supervised by the U.S. Forest Service officials. Citizens from surround areas and the National Guard also looked for Bobby. Even a group of boys from Canada aided in the search only to find nothing. Another search involving Boy Scouts failed as well. A footprint was found about 170 yards away from where Bobby was last seen, and it was small enough to fit in his shoe. Those who knew Bobby stated he was a well-behaved child and wouldn't have wandered away. Investigators and the family believe Bobby might have been abducted by a stranger while he was alone. There's little to no evidence to suggest this, since no one saw any cars on the road. It's mainly believed that Bobby was taken by a wild animal. Bobby and his family lived in Spokane at the time of his disappearance. They had moved to the area from Wyoming in July of 1962. Howard was previously stationed in Turkey when he was in the Air Force before his son disappeared and he was retired in June of 1963. The family lived at N6116 G Street in 1963. Bobby's parents died in 1999, but his brothers are still living. His case remains unsolved. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact Stevens County Sheriff's Office 509-684-5296. Number 5. David Adams vanished in May 1968 on a walk home from a friend's house, where he had been playing in his Issaquah, Washington, neighborhood. He was never seen or heard from again, and a body was never discovered. Today, 41 years after the eight-year-old boy disappeared, police say they have a person of interest in the case, and it has risen to the top of the city's other 175 unsolved murders. This one, they say, could be cracked. We believe that the Adams case is solvable, said King County Sheriff's Office spokesman Sergeant John Urquhart said. We believe this is different. Investigators from the Sheriff's Office Cold Case Squad are focusing their attention on a person of interest in the case, a man they think could have been the last person to see Adams the day he vanished. Urquhart said this man is being investigated because he does not have a good alibi. 
The spokesman declined to identify the person of interest, but told us that he was in his twenties when Adams went missing and was a neighbor of the families. The man, who has so far been cooperating with police, is now in his sixties and is a veteran of the Vietnam War, said Urquhart. The person of interest lived in the area and had the potential of being the last person who would have seen the boy, said Urquhart. We don't know that he was, but because of the route the boy took home, we believe he could have been. David Adams' family not sure if they want case revisited one of the hardest parts of retracing the steps of a cold case as old as Adams is notifying the family, said Urquhart. We probably get their hopes up and it's difficult, he said of calling Adams' parents, Anne and Don, both of whom are still alive and living in the Kings County area in Washington. I can't imagine that first phone call after not hearing from detectives in 30 or 40 years. It's been 41 years, but they don't even have a body, he said. While Adam's parents did not immediately respond to messages left by us, the boy's sister, 38-year-old Brooke Vaughn, said that after this many years, some of the family might not even want a body. This investigation is good and bad for my family, said Vaughn who was born four years after her brother disappeared. It's hard for my parents to go through, to reopen the wounds. Obviously we'd like to find out what happened to him, but in some sense my parents feel like he's in a good place, and maybe they don't want to know the details of every little incident that happened, said Vaughn. Vaughn said that her brother's disappearance was not spoken about much when she was growing up. Her other brothers and sisters four in total have all reacted differently to the new interest in the case, she said. Asked whether she believes her brother is still alive, Vaughn said, no. In addition to speaking with Adam's neighbor, Urquhart's department has also handed out a deck of playing cards, each emblazoned with a photo of a missing person, to prisons and jails. As time goes on people who might have information or known a suspect and to come forward, he said. They're not as afraid of the suspect anymore or they might be on their deathbed and what to get it off their chests. We are hopeful, said Vaughn. We always are. Adams was last seen on Tiger Mountain in King County, Washington on May 3, 1968. He was hiking with his brothers and sisters when he disappeared. An extensive search of the area turned up no sign. People theorized he was attacked by a cougar or fell into a coal mine shaft. Authorities now believe Adams may have been abducted, however. Few details are available in his case. David was last seen on May 3, 1968. On May 3, 1968, David rode the bus from Clark Elementary School to a stop along Southeast Tiger Mountain Road and then went to play with six-year-old Kevin Bryce, a friend from church. David needed to return home for dinner at about 5 p.m., and Kevin and David walked to a bridge across 15 Mile Creek. Kevin asked David if he could reach home, and David said yes and headed to the shortcut. David went missing, while returning alone from a friend's house to his home on the 14,000 block of 240 Avenue Southeast. More than 1,000 searchers, with the aid of dogs, combed Tiger Mountain in the days following his disappearance, but he was never found. They did not suspect that there was any foul play, and there was no evidence taken at the time. David was a third grader at Clark Elementary School at the time. Soon after the cold case unit re-engaged in the Adams case in early 2009, investigators collected DNA samples from Adams' family members and interviewed people connected to the case in 1968. Investigators focused for a time on a former Adams neighbor, a 20-year-old Navy corpsman in 1968. Detectives interviewed the man and conducted a polygraph test in the days after David disappeared, police records state. The man agreed to another polygraph test in April 2009 at the Lewis County Sheriff's Office. The man told Tompkins he assisted in the search, but failed the test, court documents state. The technician administering the test recorded the strongest deception reading in response to, Do you know where the body is? 
The man also told Tompkins he passed a polygraph test in May 1968, court documents state. However, the test is not included in the current Adams case file. No conclusive evidence links the man to the disappearance. Detectives working out of the King County Sheriff's Office cold case squad are taking another look at the disappearance of an Issaquah boy on Tiger Mountain over 40 years ago. Detectives are re-examining a former neighbor as a person of interest in the 1968 disappearance of eight-year-old resident David William Adams. The police interviews are intended to determine if the man, a former neighbor of the Adams family near 15 Mill Creek, could be investigated as a suspect or ruled out of the case altogether. Sheriff Spokesperson Sergeant John Urquhart said the investigation was reopened thanks to the formation of the Sheriff's Cold Case Squad this April, which is reviewing more than 175 unsolved cases still on the books. Urquhart said he believed foul play was involved in the Adams case, and that the neighbor was the last person to see him alive. He's been a person of interest for several years, Urquhart said. It is certainly worth taking another look at the case. The person of interest, now in his 60s, is a Lewis County resident. According to court documents obtained by the reporter, the man was very evasive during the search. Dead. Scott Tompkins, a member of the cold case team, said the man took a polygraph during his most recent interview and failed. Tompkins filed for a search warrant pertaining to the man's cell phone records last month as part of the investigation. We're following the evidence until it runs out, or tells us where to go, he said. Enough cold cases have developed promising leads to prompt investigators to create a deck of playing cards with 52 profiles of the cases displayed on front of the cards. David Adams is currently featured on the front of the Ace of Spades. They hope passing the playing cards out in state prisons and jails might generate more leads to solve the long dormant cases. Adams, an Issaquah elementary student at the time, was returning alone from a friend's house to his home on the 14,000 block of 240 Avenue. S.E. when he disappeared on May 3, 1968. More than 1,000 searchers, with the aid of dogs, Comb Tiger Mountain in the days following his disappearance, but he was never found. Old newspaper reports fueled speculation that the boy had fallen down an old coal mine shaft, or an animal like a cougar, or a bear attacked the boy, and carried him off. But Urquhart dismissed the old theories as uninformed hyperbole. He wasn't attacked by a wild animal, he said. He certainly didn't fall into quicksand. KING5 News also reported the former neighbor, a Vietnam vet, said he helped search for the boy decades ago. The police interrogation made him nervous, and stressed him that only reason police have focused on him is because after 40 years he's the only one still alive. Adams remains listed as missing by the state missing persons registry to this day. Thanks to a grant from the U.S. Department of Justice last April, the sheriff's office announced the cold case squad had been formed to investigate unsolved murder and missing person cases dating as far back as 1942. Two homicide detectives, Tompkins and Det. Jake Pavlovich, work with veteran Det. Tom Jensen, who arrested the Green River Killer serial killer Gary Ridgway in 2001. All cases are initially reviewed, then reviewed again, and placed in order of priority by a team of people, including cold case detectives, a prosecutor, and depending on the case, other colleagues and experts in a particular field. Other factors to be considered include the threat to the community, likelihood of successful DNA or other forensic testing, repeat offender, cost-benefit analysis of other investigative options, and the general strength of the case. In the past, Unsolved homicides were investigated by major crimes detectives along with their normal caseload which includes robberies, kidnappings, and serious assaults. That unit, however, was reduced by three positions as part of the 2009 budget cuts to the sheriff's office. The grant, worth about $500,000, runs for 18 months and covers the costs of two detectives, 
an analyst, and miscellaneous expenses associated with those investigations. After the initial 18 months the grant can be renewed, subject to an administrative performance review. Number 6. Vulnerable in Ventura, the case of Cindy Lee Mellon. In the 1960s and 1970s, long before the comfort and security of a cell phone to aid in an emergency, or the cameras along every street to provide clues in the cases of missing persons, young women simply vanished from the face of the earth never to be seen again. One such woman was Cynthia Lee Mellon. On January 20, 1970, 19-year-old Cindy Lee Mellon, as most people knew her, left her job at Broadway Department Store in Ventura, California located in the Buenaventura Shopping Center. At 10.30 p.m. after closing, two of Cindy's co-workers noticed Cindy standing by her car in the parking lot next to an unknown male tall and slim, approximately 35 to 40 years old. The man was in the process of jacking up Cindy's car. About 30 minutes later, after grabbing a cup of coffee, the co-workers passed by Cindy's car once again. This time, they saw no people around it and figured that Cindy's father had come to pick her up after having car trouble. Sadly, that wasn't the case. The next morning, at 4.45 a.m., Cindy's father awoke and immediately noticed that Cindy wasn't home and her car wasn't in the driveway. He quickly got dressed and drove to Cindy's work to see if her car was there. He found her car still up on the jack with the flat tire still on the car. Cindy's father knew something was wrong and immediately alerted police. The police came to the scene and quickly determined that Cindy was likely the victim of foul play as she was a good girl and not the type to run off or vanish on her own. The only thing police had to go on was the vague description of the man seen helping Cindy and he quickly became a suspect. One sinister fact stood out in Cindy's case. Cindy's father later examined the flat tire on her car and found that it had been deliberately punctured with a large slash in one side. Over the years, Cindy's case went cold and she quickly became just another in a long line of young women missing in California during the time. Despite the lack of answers or resolution in Cindy's case, there was a strong suspect developed. Police were trying to locate an idea Sam Roper. This was an alias allegedly used by a man named Edward Nelson Cole. Cole was suspected by many within law enforcement to have been the man seen changing Cindy's tire that night, and they believe he likely abducted and murdered her. Cole, during this time period, had a job burying pipes along the highway in Southern California, and they believe that he discarded Cindy's body burying it somewhere along the highway. In later years of the investigation, police actually had trouble locating the whereabouts of Cole. I easily found him in Florida, where he died in 2005, and passed this information along to police. Additionally, I located the real Sam Roper in South Carolina whose ID Cole had stolen. It turns out, Cole and the real Sam Roper were born on the same day. I've never been able to determine how or why Cole came to use Roper's name, or how he knew that they shared the same date of birth. I'd like to stress that Cole's alleged involvement in Cindy's case is just that alleged. There has never been enough evidence to arrest Cole, or anyone else for that matter. Cindy's case remains unsolved today 47 years later, and sadly will likely remain that way. Cindy's parents died never knowing the truth about what happened to her, or getting the closure they desperately wanted. It would be easy for Cindy's case to be forgotten after all these years, but true crime bloggers like myself won't let that happen, and we shouldn't. Cindy lives on forever on the internet, and so does the search for answers in her case.